Psalm 39. The director of music, the judge of them, a psalm of David. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, keeping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth, for you were the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me, that I may enjoy life again before I depart and am no more. Thanks very much, Jake. Well, do keep that psalm open in front of you as we uh, go through it together this morning. Over the past few weeks, if you've been coming to church, you will know that we've been going through our summer uh, psalm series. And we've been looking at what it means to give grateful praise to the Lord. What it means to shout for joy to the Lord as we praise and worship him for the countless blessings he has given us in our lives. And just last week, we had a fantastic time of worship together in this hall, didn't we? If you were here, that was an amazing time. This morning, I want us to think about what it means to you when you don't feel full of joy, when you don't feel full of praise, that you feel empty inside, and even walking through the doors of Grace Church is hard work. What does God say to us then or how can we relate to God it's easy to walk in here actually and you know to be honest feel like everyone is sorted everyone's doing really well and you are the only one inside melting and struggling and feeding at the bottom of the pit now I'm not suggesting that you come through the door and automatically you know share everything that's going on in your heart we don't do that but we want to be real don't we we want to be able to walk into church with our brothers and sisters in Christ and really express how we are feeling if we're asked. So what do we do when life is a struggle and our joy feels drained away? Well, Matt Chandler is a pastor in Texas and he's written this book uh, to help Christians in their sorrow. It's called Joy in the Sorrow, in their so Joy in the Sorrow. And it's a really, really helpful book. But I wanted just to start by reading what he says in his introduction. He says these words. Uh, in fact, no one who lives in this world is immune from suffering and turmoil. The Bible tells us that we are all sinners and sufferers living in a broken world. No one in life, no matter who you are, no matter how big your bank account, no matter how good your health, no matter how much knowledge of God and the Bible you have, no matter how obedient you might be to your faith, no one can avoid suffering. If it hasn't come to you already, it will come soon enough. Most of you here this morning in the hall will have experienced suffering in some way. And some of you, many of you maybe, are going through it right now. It's good to see you in church this morning. You could be coming from a variety of contexts, couldn't you? Physical and mental pain depression, 
loss of loved ones, bereavement, sickness, financial difficulties, and loneliness. It's hard, it's hard, and I want to acknowledge it's hard this morning. I don't want to stand here and pretend it's not. But I want you to know that as a church, we want to walk alongside you in your suffering. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you with God's word. We want to stand side by side with you as you go through your intense suffering, don't we? Well, Psalm 39 is written by David, and he is described as a man after God's own heart, as well as a king. And yet, despite these titles, he is in turmoil. In the verses we've just read, we get a glimpse into David's raw and uncensored emotions. And it's my belief this morning that by looking at Psalm 39, we can see things in this psalm that will help us in our suffering. So my first point, in fact, all my points are on the screen uh, as we go through. My first point is, in your anger and despair, pray to God. So what do you do when you're feeling joyless? What do you do when you're irritated or annoyed in a time of suffering? Let me just pray for us as we look at this psalm in more depth. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that we can be uh, here this morning as your church. As we look at your word now, we pray, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts that you would speak into the context that we are struggling with, the background that we are coming from. Please speak to us as individuals this morning, as well as a church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me go back to those questions. How, what do you do when you're feeling joyless? What do you do when you're irritated or annoyed and going through a time of trials or suffering? Well, there are two common ways in which you may react. One, you could isolate yourself from everyone else. You could feel like you don't want to see anyone. You don't want to speak to anyone. And in fact, you want to isolate yourself from God. You might stop praying. You might stop reading your Bible. You might stop speaking to your Christian friends. To try and cope with our sufferings in the best way we can at the time. That might be your natural response. Or number two, suffering may cause us to run to God in prayer, to get down on our knees, to humble ourselves, to beg God for his mercy. Maybe you've experienced both of these. Maybe you have seasons where you run to God in prayer and other seasons where you just cannot do it. In Psalm 39, David thinks he's suffering either as a result of God's discipline for a sin that he's committed or he's suffering due to a sickness that God has laid on him. In both cases, David acknowledges that who's, the, who's responsible for putting this on me? It's my God. He doesn't shift the blame somewhere else. He doesn't look, make excuses for God. He says God is the one who is causing this. To back this up, verse 10 and 11, David says, if you look at your Bible, David says, remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. So the exact details we aren't given, and actually we don't really need to know. But what we see in the midst of this turmoil is a very real and a very honest response from David to his suffering. Look at verse one, David says, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle over my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So what does David do as he's feeling joyless and angry? Well, he says that he will muzzle his mouth. He will stay completely silent. I don't recommend getting a dog's muzzle and putting it on your face. But that's what he is intimating, isn't it? He's going to say, absolutely silent. I'm not going to say anything. Right, done. Now, in one way, that's a good thing to do. Because if you read in that verse, he says, I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. See, David isn't concerned about uh, going to his neighbours and complaining. Uh, but he is concerned about who the audience is. Let me say that again. David isn't concerned about waking up the neighbours with his shouts, but he is concerned with who his audience is. He's surrounded by the wicked, people who didn't know God, people who didn't honour God, people who didn't believe in God, and he knew that to take his troubles to these people would not be a wise thing to do, not a godly thing to do. David, a man after God's own heart, is loyal to God, even in his suffering. 
we find him totally committed to honouring the Lord's name. Now, for us living in Worcester Park and the surrounding communities, we are like David, surrounded by people who don't yet know Jesus or people who've sadly chosen to reject him. And people, unfortunately, would love to distort the words of Christians, wouldn't they? To take them out of context. But David knows he is called to a higher standard, as we are, to exercise godly self-control and wisdom. As Christians, we're called to be different from the community around us. We are called to put our hope in Jesus and to use our words to honour people and build them up, to encourage people, not to offload all our disgruntlement onto them. Now, this can be especially hard in times of suffering, but David models for us when we speak, when we cry out in suffering and in our despair, we take it to one person, that is God. The good news is about our God is our God is bigger than all our problems. He's bigger than all our suffering and pain. And he wants us to take these things to him. He wants us to cry out to him for mercy. So we must honour God with our tongues. And that's the response we see from David initially. But the second part is not so good. Look at verse two to three. So David said, I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. So I'm not going to say anything bad to my neighbours, but actually I'm not going to say anything good either. And what happens? His anguish increases. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an argument with a, a spouse or a friend. And you tell yourself, this time, whatever happens, I'm not going to be the one who's going to apologise. Not going to happen, Right? I'm talking about personal experience here. You clench your fists, you clench your teeth, and you think, right, I'm just going to sit on this one. That person is going to apologise to me this time. I'm resolved. And you begin stewing. And the magma begins boiling up under the surface. You become a human volcano. And if you're anything like David, you know this can be really hard until finally... You explode. And that's what we see. I love this phrasing he uses, but he says, my heart grew hot within me, my anger increased. It's a funny line, isn't it? Verse three, if you can call this uh, Psalm funny. David says, while I meditated, which in our culture means silence and reflection, while I meditated, the fire burned. Eventually, David was forced to speak out, wasn't he? And there's amazing realness and rawness to David's response, isn't there? He explodes and goes straight to God. He goes straight to God. Now, how easy is that for you and I this morning? When you are, when you are in a fit of rage or despair, do you go straight to God? I'm guessing what you might do is go straight to this. Straight to your mobile phone. You might go to Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, WhatsApp, can't think of any others, but there are thousands of them. So easy for us to just log in there and take our complaints online, isn't it? Why take our complaints to a creator God when we can give them to millions of people we'll never meet? Unfortunately, that seems to be our culture, doesn't it? We live in an age of where self-expression is, uh, is the norm. If you've got a problem, take it online. Take it online rather than to the God who created us. I don't know if you follow celebrity news, but uh, over the last few months, you kind of escaped, if you do, the Wagatha Christie trial. Anyone seen that? Mm -hmm. A few nods. The Wagatha Christie trial was two millionaires, Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney, Colleen Rooney, going through a high court battle because of comments they made to each other on Instagram. Reputation versus reputation in the high court for the whole world to see. Now, Rebe Rebecca Vardy lost in this case after having details of her private life exposed, her family put through the media, and relationships ruined on both sides. So is that enough for her to back down, go quietly? Unfortunately not. She has just said she's going to launch a TV show and a book to restore her reputation. All of the venting all of the effort to sue each other, all of the millions of pounds spent, 
but where is it going and who's it going to? The question is, will it even be remembered next year? Going back to David in his anger, you may have expected him to tell the world, to blurt it out. But instead of doing that, he suspends his social media accounts. Instead, he prays to God. He takes everything to his God. So my first point up there is in your anger and despair, pray, pray to the Lord. <coughs> and two, put your hope in the Lord. In verses four to six, we get an insight into David's prayer to God. And it's not what we expect. Instead of why are you doing this, God? Why am I suffering? Why, why, why? We get David asking God to show him the reality of how many days he's left to endure his suffering. Imagine this if you're not suffering. Imagine that this or live it out if you are suffering. You're worn out. You're tired. You're exhausted. How many days left do I have to endure this, God? It's natural to want it to be all over, isn't it? I know when I'm suffering, sometimes really badly, I just want it to be over. Verse four, David says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my de days a mere handbreadth, the span of my years as is nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. In this vivid description on the brevity of life, David pauses in verse seven to recognize what life is all about. What is the solution to all your sufferings? What is the solution to everything that goes on in your life? Verse seven, but now Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Amazing words. David knows he can hope in the Lord. He knows God is his only hope as we've discussed this morning because everything else is meaningless. And this echoes the book of Ecclesiastes chapter one that says this, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. What do people gain from their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come, generations go, the earth remains forever. David was the second king over God's people, Israel. He founded the Judean dynasty and united all the tribes of, tribes of Israel under a single monarch. He enjoyed great success as a special forces warrior and an empire builder, and yet was just as vulnerable to sin as you and I. When writing this Psalm, David is now entering the final stages of his life. He's an old man now. And in 1 Kings chapter one, if you read that, you see a power struggle going on behind his back. As David is dying, nearing the end of his age, one of his sons is actually trying to take power from him and become king. And everyone else around him is, is struggling and jostling for positions in this new incoming administration. All this going on in the midst of his suffering. So David recognizes even in his day that people rushed around trying to get positions of power, trying to build up their wealth, trying to get possessions, but for what? One day, as Nigel said earlier, it will all be swept away. In Psalm 103, verse 13 to 16, David says, the life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. Well, lots of people shy away from uh, their own mortality in our culture, don't they? I remember a few years ago uh, when we were thinking about buying a property, lots of uh, estate agents used to talk to us about buying our forever home. A home that once you bought it would be safe and secure for eternity. How can that be true? How can that be true? And I wonder how often do you think about the brevity of your life? There are two things that remind me of the brevity of my life as I was thinking about this psalm. They are birthdays and funerals. Sorry, Bill, it was your birthday yesterday. <laughs> but recently, some of you will know that I turned 40. And uh, Lorna will tell you that in my thoughts leading up to my birthday, I always start whirring in my head. Gosh, isn't life going fast? How many years have I got left? 
I look back at my photos from old holidays and I look so different. You wouldn't recognize me. My hair was completely black. I was slimmer. I had loads of energy. Our times have changed. Also, my granddad and I used to talk about our family history a lot as we used to go for walks together. When I was young, he used to tell me stories about his own grandfather and his funeral and how in those days they carried his grandfather's coffin on a horse and cart through the cobbled streets of a village in South Yorkshire up to the uh, graveyard because there were no cars. To me, that seemed like ancient history. Something that wasn't reality for us. That was until a couple of years ago in 2020 when I found myself taking my own grandma's funeral and scattering his ashes by the Thames. I know many of you will be able to uh, relate to similar experiences in your family, but it's times like that in your life, these major events, when you realize time is marching on. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? One generation comes, one generation goes. But maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, so what? There's nothing I can do about it. Just let it come. It'd be sad if that was the case, wouldn't it? So what? That's the end of the service. See you next week. Well, the Bible says that you actually have two choices in this life. You can live for yourself thinking, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Or you can live for the Lord. The Bible says that is the only option with real hope. And that is what we see David doing in Psalm 39. Even when everything is stripped away, remember there is hope in God. What do I look for, David says, my hope is in God. And point three, encounter Jesus. David wanted to be rid of all his transgressions. That is a good place to be with God, isn't it? Trial should cause us to examine ourselves to see what God may be trying to teach us. Now, I'm not going to stand here this morning and say, you know, I know exactly the reason why you're going through your suffering. Okay, I'm not God. You might have noticed, but I can't say why certain people go through suffering, why certain people seem to go through more suffering than others as Christians. We don't know, do we? But we do know that we can trust our Father who wants good things for our lives who has a plan for each one of us sitting here this morning. That is an encouragement. David here realized that God was disciplining him in his context. As I said before in verse 10 and 11, verse 11, when you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Why would God consume as a moth what is precious to us? It's a funny thing to say, isn't it? It sounds a bit cruel. Well, the answer is because we're counting the wrong things as precious so often. Our hope isn't fully in the Lord, but it's in other things. So God has to consume those things to show us that he alone is worth hoping in. He alone is the one that saves. I put this example in my sermon and I showed Lord and she said, no, you're going to take that out. But I'm going to share it. <laughs> Recently, Lorna and I uh, got a new car. I'm not saying that to boast. You hear the rest of the story. Uh, we got a new car and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to buy a uh, roof rack, which I've always wanted, and a uh, bike carrier, which I've always wanted. And we spent ages online searching for these things. You know, there's so much choice in there. You go to all these different advisor websites. There's too many, there's too many. And you spend hours and hours of your time looking at that, getting the car you want. Right, we, we figured on the small car, good for the family, put the roof rack on. Last Thursday, put the bikes on the top. And we thought, oh, we could just go to Horton Country Park, if you know that, down the road. It's family cycling. And uh, Lauren and I were chatting in the car, catching up about our days, and then suddenly, bang! I looked in my rear view mirror, and we just hit a height restriction bar. <laughs> The carrier lifted off the car with the bikes attached, scraped across the top of the car and landed on the ground. 
I have to say, for the rest of that day, I, I can smile now, but the rest of that day, I was not in the best of moods. <laughs> what did I do? Did I take my anger and frustration to God? That point of suffering is nothing compared to what some of you are going through. Nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, it's a first world problem. But did I take it to God? Be honest, no, I didn't. I fumed. I locked myself away. Uh, I actually was angry with myself, not with God. I wasn't angry with God, but I was angry with myself. What if I'd done something different? What, what happens if I'd looked? What happens if I didn't go cycling? Blah, blah, blah. The list goes on. But it reminds me of a verse in Luke 12 uh, I was looking at, reflecting on. Jesus said, be warned, life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Interesting, isn't it? That verse came to my mind. We don't like to think that we are obsessed with possessions or that we gather more and more and more. But I did spend hours and hours, probably of wasted time looking back on it, researching all these things, trying to get the best. These things don't last. And God shows us that. And maybe you've got examples of that as well. So I wasn't supposed to say that, but there you go. <laughs> it just came to me. As we look at uh, the end of Psalm 39, David's final plea is full of mixed emotions. He pleads with God to remove the trial before he perishes. And yet he acknowledges God's right to reprove him, showing his sub submission to God's hand. His final appeal in 12 to 13, verses 12 to 13, contains a, contains a plea that God would hear his prayer, his cry and his tears with increasing intensity. I don't know if you've ever prayed like that before, where you're so desperate, you've got tears. Clenched fists, crying out to God. David asked God to turn away from him with his gaze so that he can have a brief respite from his trials before he dies. Again, that, that would be a depressing place to leave our sermon, wouldn't it? Turn your face away from me, God. I can't handle any more. The end. But it isn't the end for God. It isn't the end for us as we experience our suffering. It wasn't the end for David. You've got to take this psalm in the context that he was speaking in. He's speaking out his thoughts. When we're angry, when we're suffering, when we're frustrated, we don't always end on a joyous note, do we? So I love this because he's being real. In fact, so many details from David's lament remind us of another cry of anguish, don't they? Not speaking out in the sight, not speaking out on the cross. Remember, when Jesus was betrayed and arrested, his guards mocked him. They spat in his face. They threatened him. They goaded him. But Jesus remained silent. At all times, we read that he entrusted himself to his father, God. He didn't take the bait. So Jesus knows what it is to suffer to experience pain, loneliness, frustration. Jesus knows what it means to trust in God and pour your heart out to him. We saw that in the garden, or we read about that in the garden of Gethsemane, didn't Gethsemane, don't we? He poured his heart out to God. Jesus knows what it's like to live in a sinful world and deal with the daily frustrations and temptations that we face. And Jesus understands what it means to be full of despair and exhausted. On the cross, Jesus let out a cry of anguish to God. He poured out his heart in honesty. And in that moment, God's response was to turn his face from Jesus. But not in abandonment, but in hope. On the cross, God punished Jesus for all our sins, past, present and future. God turned his face away from Jesus so that we could be forgiven and he could then turn his face towards us and accept us as his children forever. Amazing. Jesus willingly suffered the greatest pain because he knew the end of the history. And so do we if we trust in Jesus. Death in this life is not the end for us. It's another beginning, or some people say it is the beginning. Revelation 21, three to four says these words. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. 
he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things, this world has passed away. We love movies that end with happiness and joy because we're created to know and walk with God. And for those who place their faith in Jesus, the ending will become the reality. Eternity awaits us. Eternity awaits us. Now that's hard, isn't it, when we're suffering to think about eternity. Sometimes we just can't put that into uh, meaning. But we have the cross. God has given us the cross as a tangible reminder that the end is coming. And one day we will be forever with God. So as I come to a close, I want you to remember that when we finish the sermon today, your suffering is not going to end miraculously. It might do, okay? It might do, because God can do anything. But it might be that you come back next week and you still feel crushed. Or in the week ahead, you feel joyless. But I believe Psalm 39 is something you can look back to and remember David's example of what he did in his suffering, in his rawness, in his honesty. Some words from Jesus uh, to encourage us. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not give, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is here with us by his spirit. He promises to be with us. We have his spirit as a gift working inside us to help us in the trials and suffering we face in this life. He is our joy. He is our comfort. I'm going to finish my sermon there, but I want us to spend a few minutes just in silence. Taking this as an opportunity to be honest and open with God, to pour out your heart to him. We can bring to him what ever is on our minds. So I'm going to stop talking. We'll have a moment of silence and then I'll pray. Father God, we come to you this morning as vulnerable and weak. People who are suffering, people who are going through trials and temptations. Father, we thank you that you are the God who listens to us. We thank you that you bring us eternal hope. Father, as we leave here today, please bless us. Please be with us. Please fill us with your spirit. Please help us to face whatever is coming at us as we walk out those doors, either externally or internally. Father, we trust you. We love you. We thank you so much for Jesus. In his name, we pray and praise you. Amen. I'll come back to Tim.